So I wanted to ask you this morning, have any of you ever heard of Cardinal Jaime Sin? Cardinal Sin, a good number of you, yes. Cardinal Sin was the beloved Archbishop of Manila, the Philippines. And he was the center of a very remarkable event that took place there in the Philippines in 1986. And I want to tell you that story, the story of Cardinal Sin and what he did for the people in the Philippines. Some of you might know this story well, yes? And some of you might had been there when it took place. Well, that year, 1986, in the Philippines, there was the threat of a civil war. The people in the Philippines were fed up with the violence and the corruption happening under the totalitarian dictator, Ferdinand Marcos. In February of 86, there was a group of military generals and soldiers who basically had a coup to overthrow Marcos. Well, Marcos was very upset and he ordered the arrest of these high-ranking military officials. In response, these military generals decided to barricade themselves inside the barracks, uh, a set of barracks in Manila, and they vowed to fight to the death should Marcos put up a fight. Now, traitors to Marcos, but still very much, you know, for the people, um, they look to Cardinal Sin, Cardinal Jaime Sin, their archbishop, for spiritual guidance and support. Well, this put the cardinal in a very delicate place because if he got involved and it went wrong, there could be an all-out civil war. Well, the cardinal did something very counterintuitive, something that not a lot of leaders did, but he did. The cardinal went into his private chapel at his home and he knelt down in front of Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament, and he prayed. He prayed fervently for guidance of what to do. It said that he prayed for two straight hours. They said that at times he looked very joyful, at other times he looked like Jesus in the agony in the garden. At one point they said when the cardinal was praying, he laid flat down on the floor in front of the tabernacle, begging Jesus for help. Well, after his two hours of deep prayer, the cardinal emerged, and he took to the airwaves, the radio waves, Radio Ver Veritas, I think it was called, and he called upon the people, ordinary citizens, to go out into the streets and to stand right between the rebels that were barricaded and Marcos's troops that were sent in to get them. So the cardinal was asking the people, stand in the line of fire. Well, a remarkable thing happened, and it astounded the whole world. It wasn't just a handful of people that showed up, but two million people showed up. Ordinary citizens. They came out into the streets, and here's the thing. They weren't carrying guns. They weren't carrying weapons. What did they carry? The most holy rosary. They hold up their rosaries and they look to young and old, rich and poor, housewives and, and maids and jeepney drivers and teachers, students, priests. They all stood and looked at the tanks and the guns and they raised up their rosary on high and said, Hail Mary of grace. The Lord is with thee. That vigil went on for four straight days. They sang hymns, they said prayers, they did novenas, they showed charity to the soldiers of Marcos. They threw flowers at them and gave them food. The bishops and the priests, they said mass right in the middle of the street. And a bunch of nuns, contemplative nuns, fasted and prayed and kept watch. Another remarkable thing had happened. The troops that were sent by Marcos, you know what they did? They put down their guns, they picked up their rosaries, and they also prayed. Marcos eventually resigned, and in the end, not one 
drop of blood was shed by anybody. Whoa. The victory here is the triumph of prayer and the triumph of true Christian discipleship over anything. You see, disciples of the Lord, as ordinary as they are, those were two million disciples of Jesus. They were ordinary people, Filipinos. They were church people. They had the power to do something amazing because they said yes to God's call. My brothers and sisters, hear again the message that was said to the disciples today that Jesus says to us, come follow me. Come follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And that's why I put this image up here. That's the call of the first disciples. It's by Giotto. It's one of my favorites. A priest friend of mine gave it to me when I was in the seminary. And he says, whenever you're doubting your vocation or you're worried, look at that first call. And remember what Jesus called, who he called. He called you. That call, come follow me, is repeated here this morning. And I tell you that story about the cardinal and the rosary revolution of 1986 because I think it highlights what Jesus expects of us. What Jesus wants from us, everybody, is the message of my homily. And it boils down to this. Jesus calls on the ordinary to do something extraordinary. Amen? Amen. Jesus calls on you, the ordinary, the simple, people like us, the disciples. He calls on us, the ordinary, to do something amazing, to do something extraordinary. But why does Jesus need ordinary? And why does he call ordinary? Well, we heard two words today, two names, Zebulon and Naphtali. There's a little backstory to those, Zebulun and Naphtali. Those was, it was a region, see, in the northern part of Israel, the region of Zebulun and Naphtali. It was a very beautiful region. It was very sunny. It was warm. There was a nice lake there. It was fertile soil. It was great. People liked it. Well, in the 8th century before Jesus, the neighbors to the north of Israel were called the Assyrians. And the Assyrians said, you know what? We want some of that nice land, too, for ourselves. So what they do? They invaded Israel. And the first territory to get the brunt of the attack was whom? Are you with me so far? Zebulun and Naphtali. They're the ones that were taking the brunt of this wave of attack. Well, the Assyrians, they conquered Israel, and you know what they did to the inhabitants of Zebulun and Naphtali? They gathered up all their rich people, all their leaders of government and religion, all the leaders of art and education and science. They packed them up and shipped them off to Assyria to become slaves. And what they left in Zebulun and Naphtali were the peasants, the ordinary folk. So eight centuries later, in comes Jesus Christ. He walks into a town in Zebulun and Naphtali called Capernaum. And who does Jesus call? Peter, Andrew, James, and John. Who are they? The leftovers. Jesus called some ordinary Hicktown slobs to follow him. And he called them to do something amazing, and indeed they did. And they helped Jesus in building a new kingdom, a kingdom built on justice and peace and mercy. And just like that, these ordinary Hicktown guys, Peter, Andrew, James, and John, the other disciples, become beacons of light in the darkness. Do you get it, everyone? Greatness is not a prerequisite to follow Christ. Amen? You don't need to be great when Jesus calls you. He'll make you great, but all you need to be is willing and open and ordinary. Today is my, ends, my first week as the administrator, uh, pastor, whatever you want to call it, of Holy Spirit Parish. Well, sometime this week, somebody asked me, Father, 
what qualifications do you have, young man, of running such a big parish? You know what I said? None. None. There was a time when I would have said, well, I had a Roman education, I have two master's degree, I was principal's principal. Nobody cares. But what I said to this guy was this. I think the only qualification I have is I love Jesus and I love the people. Is that enough? Yeah. That's what God wants from each of us. God has great plans for your lives. Amazing, beautiful plans. And I invite you today, let's trust that, huh? And I promise that if we follow Jesus wholeheartedly and lovingly, then we will do amazing things. And all the things that we do that we accomplish in our ordinary lives, it will stretch far. It will stretch to heaven. We'll be with God one day face to face and enjoy the communion of saints forever. And if you ask me, everyone, that's pretty extraordinary. Amen.